coming back to normal slowly. Yes. Yeah, it was the Hanover Fair this week too in Germany that ended today or yesterday, and that was uh, that was nice too. I saw some pictures on LinkedIn. It was pretty cool. It yeah, looked like a party. Hmm? Yeah, like it was full staff. So maybe maybe we'll get to kick this off again very soon. Although we have some by the end of the year. Let's go ahead and get started. I we're past our time by now to get kicked off. Uh, my name is Josh uh, Josh Benoit. I almost said my radio name, Josh Benoit, <laughs> with ePlan USA Marketing. And I want to let everybody know before do we we start really get into this that this is being recorded. It's our webcast series called Open Line Friday. Our experts are here to talk to you and answer your questions. And really, it's a chance for you to get to know us here at ePlan, and not even me. I mean, nobody wants to know the marketing guy. It's it's our our experts that work with ePlan. So you'll get to ask those questions. You can leave those in the chat. Nothing real, like overly technical, because we're not. I would say completely set up to take those really big technical questions. But we want to hear from you for sure. So leave your questions in the chat or the Q and A, and we'll get to that. And so. Uh, without further ado, we heard Sean talking already. So, uh, Sean Mulheron is our solutions architect that's with us today. And we got Joanna Pruden, who is our account manager. Thanks so much, both of you, for hanging out and giving me your time today because I know that this is probably the last thing you wanted to do was hang out with the marketing guy for your lunch. Sean, where? Well, I'm here on the West Coast. I got a long time before lunch. Oh, that, that's right. So we're kind of spread out. I'm in Houston. Sean, you're in Detroit? Detroit, Michigan, yep. Okay, and you're on the, the West Coast up like in Washington? I'm in the Seattle area. Okay, gotcha. So let's go ahead and talk about our experts here. We got Sean, who I, I asked you where you were from before we had this meeting, and you said you were from Michigan. And so I feel like you have a very authentic Michigan accent. And you said, <laughs> you said, well, that's where I've been for a long time. So we'll say that I'm from Michigan. <laughs> Yes, but I you, mean, uh, keep, keep, keeping it simple, otherwise it would probably take the, the rest of the hour just to explain my background. But in, uh, in, in brief, I, I grew up in Europe most of my life, born in Hamburg, Germany, so I'm a true hamburger. Uh, <laughs> grew up in the Basque country, so a little country in the Pyrenees for 14 years, then moved to Germany for 11 years, and that's where I started to work with ePlan when I was 19 years old. And, um, yeah, we talked about that yesterday. That 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 was your first job was with ePlan twenty eight years ago. That's right. With uh, with nineteen in nineteen ninety three, started working with ePlan, and uh, and since my mother's American, my father's Irish, I had an American passport and never lived in the U.S., so decided to check it out. And ePlan had a division in the U.S., so in two thousand, moved to the U.S. and landed in Waukesha, Wisconsin. And then uh, from Waukesha, we moved the headquarters to Detroit and then kind of been in Detroit since 2004 and uh, working out of the out of the U.S. office. Was the U.S. everything that you thought it was going to be? And then some. OK. And then I mean, some. you've been here long enough to wait. You haven't left yet. You're hanging That's out right. with us. You're staying with us. That's right. No, it's been a, it's been a lot of fun. There's certainly difference in cultures, but uh, everybody has their advantages and their disadvantages. It's just a question of. Uh, making the best out of it. I don't see anything wrong with living in Houston. I, I love living over here and on, on the south side, but whenever I go north, whenever I go in into Chicago or Schaumburg and it's 70 degrees or 65 degrees in the middle of summer, I feel like I am missing out on a little bit. Uh, it's probably the same in Seattle too. Yeah. I'm the opposite though. I go to Chicago and I think I forgot about what winter is, you know, <laughs> it doesn't get to that negative time here. So. Sean, talking about your hobbies uh, outside of ePlan, because we all know that everybody w that works at ePlan, our favorite thing to do is talk about ePlan, but uh, I, I think it is for you because I asked you what your hobbies were. You said showing customers benefits of ePlan and interacting with customers that you work with in ePlan and colleagues worldwide in, uh, in uh, e, e plan, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, 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 I have to say, I'm very fortunate because I absolutely love what I do. And when they say, when you love what you do, you don't work a single day in your life. Well, I've been on vacation since 1993, so uh, <clears throat> e plan is really a, a fun, fun place to work and fun software solution. But when I go home, I do switch off, and uh, I enjoy playing soccer. I play 
I played in Germany at uh, what is it, Division Six, something like that. Uh, so uh, good, good or decent level, and I still play here in the over forties and over forty eight. So it keeps me busy, keeps me uh, halfway in shape, and uh, I like to play golf and uh, other different sports too. So a lot of fun. In that in that over forty eight division, do they? Is it five? Do you play like five minutes and then you take a uh, an hour break? Is that how that works? They're pretty close, yeah. It's just a bunch of geriatrics running around, and <laughs> <laughs> we're just looking forward to drinking the beers after the game. That's it. You know, I, I could get in there for that. Uh, so, Joanna, we we know that you're that you you're around Seattle. You're from Washington. You've been in with ePlan for three years and uh, went to Laterno University. So, tell us about your time with ePlan so far. Yeah, well, yeah this is. I'm, I think I'm about three and a half years in, and you know, I'm. It's been a little bit of a, a different culture the last two years because we haven't been able to get together and see our customers face to face. So, you know, I'm glad to see some of that coming back. Um, it's you know been exciting. I've been on the opposite end of the the engineering side, and I worked in process engineering and system automation before coming to ePlan and seeing it from this side and, you know, automation that we're able to provide our customers. It, it's been exciting to learn more about and see how the market's changed and just what we can do and how our customer base has changed and growing. And it, it's been an exciting time, even with the pandemic. Yeah, you were saying just uh, before we, we really started that you're able to, to get almost back to normal a little bit. You're at, you can get out there and, yeah. and see people. Yeah, you know, it's, I think this has been one of the slower areas to kind of get back to normal. And a lot of companies have still had remote employees. So even though restrictions were lifted, a lot of people just weren't coming into the office yet. And that really feels like we're starting to get back to normal. So it's, it's been nice to get back out there. So unlike Sean, I love what I do, I, mean, I think that's, well, I was just going to say one of the things I love most about this job is seeing how, you know, manufacturing is done across the different industries and I think I've been to over 500 manufacturing plants in the U.S. just throughout my career so getting back out there and seeing how things have changed and seeing people that's that's what gets me out of bed in the morning and makes me excited to go to work. Right so uh like I was saying unlike Sean uh who if he's not working with ePlan he's talking about ePlan and hanging out with people that work at ePlan uh, you actually have other things you like to do, like uh, fishing and scuba diving, uh, yes. sea-related things. Now, what kind of fishing do you like to do? You know, um, I really like halibut fishing, crabbing, salmon fishing, you name it. So, okay, just being on the water. And now I know to never invite Sean along. Yeah, because All the only thing he's going to do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that, I, that, you know what? You bring his laptop that's... and do a presentation for me. <laughs> no, not, not that he... bad. Not that bad. No, what he'll do is he'll he'll pull oh, you okay. into okay. a YouTube video. That he'll pull you into a YouTube video and say, "Hey, look, I have a yes. really great idea. Like, what, what do you think about this?" And he hits record before he really tells you what's going on. And that's and the next thing you know, you're in oh. one of his videos. But since you like scuba diving, the uh, the picture behind me is uh, Saint John, U.S. Virgin Islands. Both of my sisters live there, and it's a fabulous place to go scuba diving and and also underwater fishing. Lobster, oh, yeah. and so I would highly recommend it if you get the chance. You can yes, arrange sir. that for your YouTube video recording location. I'm there. That's right. <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't get the memo. We talked about this before we started. Uh, we had to put actual places that we we go on vacation, and so I, I put 30A behind me, which 30A is a strip of, uh, it's this road in Florida between Panama City and Destin, and that's where my, my wife's family has gone for the last 65 years for vacation, so I decided I would, I would sport where my vacation is too. Um, Although you probably have some some good pictures of where you live around there on the coast anyway, Joanna. So uh, I think that that um, your video would be more true to what you do on a, a daily basis than us just going on vacation every yeah. week. Yeah, I'm really lucky that way. Yeah, I have to travel hard to see some of the 
Korea's coastline. So that's lucky. So let's get into talking about some e-plan. And we meet most of the time, we'll meet early in the week and we'll talk about, well, what are some some issues that you, you've you talked to people about ePlan and uh, what are, are the most common questions that we get from consumers of the software? And one thing that Sean brought up, which I feel like is a very important question, and again, we don't want to get too far into the, the technical aspect, but uh, something that you brought up, Sean, earlier in the week was, what's the difference between CAE and CAD? Okay, and and that's something that you've heard recently, and and you wanted to address. Yeah, um, well, it was it was interesting because we went to I don't know if you followed the virtual fair, and there was that interview we did with Brendan Fritz from um, Automated Drive Systems out in uh, Omaha, Nebraska. And starting in the interview, he was talking about the difference. He he didn't quite understand the difference between CAD and CAE at the beginning. And once he did, he just jumped to ePlan and just never looked back. And I think identifying that difference is crucial to either to to gaining a lot of efficiency in your engineering processes. And there are two terms that are that correlate with CAD and CAE is digitization and digitalization. And in the English world or English speaking world, we kind of use one for the other and intertwine both and mix them up but there's a crucial difference between the two and to explain it simply it's kind of when you scan a document if you just scan a document you've got a digital version of the document but you can't really do anything you can just visualize it on your screen and that's it it's just a bunch of pixels and nothing more however if you take that document and you use an ocr tool and you kind of extract all of the letters and and maybe some more intelligent vector graphics, then suddenly you can reuse that data in other documents. You can do copy and paste, you can further process the data. So that's really the difference between digitization, which is just scanning, and digitalization, which is taking the data out of the digital the digitization basically of the document. And it's kind of the same thing with CAD and CAE. So CAD is really just a graphical representation of data on a computer screen that allows you to design, to draft, to represent things. However, there is no data behind it. There's just graphical data. If you want to further process information, you want to add additional properties, you want to add additional data to those objects that are there digitally. And that's where the CAE aspect comes in, where you have more data that you can further process. I mean, just taking an example of a part number Part number has part number, descriptor, and manufacturer. Now, if you want to add all of the drilling information, the drilling patterns, the wiring information, you want to add all of the electrical calculation values, then you can send it to simulation tools, then you can send it to production machinery and things like that. So it's a it's a crucial difference when you when you look at both. But I don't think that the market, I mean, talking to a lot of people that are still using, you know, CAD tools to do their engineering. They still haven't grasped that concept, and uh, sometimes it takes a while. But once you realize it, it's quite a quite a drastic difference. Yeah, Joanna, do you see that whenever you're talking to potential clients or or someone that's interested in using ePlan? Absolutely. Yeah, I think as Sean said, it's when you're using a CAD tool, it, it's just a picture. And, you know, a lot of customers go down the journey of, of trying to get more sophisticated in their data and they take a picture and add information, but they don't add a lot of the manufacturing data, the you know, drilling pattern, the electrical, the wiring, and it still is just kind of a picture with some notes. So trying to get customers to understand the power of data and how that can be used, you know, from the coding process, manufacturing process to you know, the service side of things 10 years after the, you know, project is installed, it, it's a powerful tool. Yeah, I kind of think of it this way, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, is that when you talk about there being data and not being data, you know, back whenever we took Polaroid pictures, it was a singular picture and it, it was just a flat picture, you know, we're able to look at it and it, it's a pretty picture, we put it up on the wall. And then whenever digital cameras came around, 
Well, what we didn't understand was that there was a lot of data behind it. There's metadata that goes into it where it would point out your specific location when the picture was taken um, and it would give you reference points behind the image that we didn't know until later on. So whenever I remember 10 years ago posting a photo on Facebook and somebody said, well, I, I didn't know that you were in you know, Louisiana at this time. And I said, how did you know that picture was from Louisiana? Well, they can track from that photo that you put on Facebook. They can track exactly where that photo was taken. Mm -hmm. the time, unless you turn off uh, location services or it's the same thing with the digital picture that whenever you, you have to turn that off because it comes with that data. Is that is that kind of a good way to summarize it? It's similar. It's just a question of instead of just having pixels and, and, and colors and graphics, it's really just adding additional information, as you said, metadata associated with it to be able to leverage additional application like geo tracking in your case, or even Google Maps, and then you can pinpoint the location of that picture. So it's using the data that's available in one environment to drive other systems and, and interact with other systems as well. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of data, legacy data is something we talked a little bit about last week and how we use legacy data whenever we're starting off with ePlan. And uh, Joanne, I know that that's probably a question that you get pretty often whenever you're you're talking to someone new to, to ePlan. How do you bring this into the software? So how do you address that? Sure. I think it's just a, a, a conversation about understanding what you have. So for a lot of customers, there's a concern about, hey, I have this CAD file. How do I bring that into ePlan? And sure, you can bring a CAD file into ePlan, but you don't automatically gain the data that was never put into it in the first place. So you still just have a picture. Um, so when we talk about bringing in that legacy information, it, it's more of a conversation of, you're not going to increase the amount of knowledge that you have by importing it. You still don't have the data. So when you look at a migration into a software tool like you, you want to talk about where we start now for building the future. So the legacy data that you have, it's always going to be there and it's always going to be just as basic as it was when you created it. Moving forward, how do you stop that? How do you change what you're able to get? How do you change? how you process information, you're reporting the information that you have. And that's by starting with your, your basic projects that you can build off of, maybe your high volume projects to where that way, you know, you have a, a, a start, you have your foundation. And then, you know, if, if, if it makes sense to bring in an image, you certainly can, but understanding, you know, you're going from having a, a Polaroid picture that you've scanned Versus the digital photo that has made it data. You know, you're, you can bring in a picture. It's still just a unintelligent image. It's not going to say where you were. It's not going to say, you know, what camera lens was used. It's not going to give you any of that data. So it, it's often not really a benefit to customers to try to pull that information in. Gotcha. And Sean, uh, let me, uh, Sean, I'm going to have you answer this real quick. And Joanna, I want to let you, like, the your your audio is a little choppy. It, could you, like, disconnect and reconnect for us so I can get a, a, a maybe a little bit clearer signal? Is that cool? And so, Sean, while she's Absolutely. doing that, um, you'll be our distraction. You're going to be like the magician. You know, look at this hand while this hand does something else. Um, and, and, you know, tell us your thoughts about that. Well, <clears throat> legacy data is is always built on the legacy tools that you have. And as Joanna correctly pointed it out, you only have as much data as the legacy tools allow you to enter in there. And most of the time, if you talk about CAD legacy data, there's really not much except just graphical blocks and maybe a bit of text, and that's about it. So bringing that information in ePlan is really not necessarily going to give you any added value, except for maybe five minutes of trying to recreate that particular block inside of ePlan. And we, we've, we've gone through a similar experience without even talking about legacy data when we migrated from ePlan 5 to ePlan Electric P8. ePlan 5 had a certain amount of, of, of libraries, it had a certain amount of templates, it had parts information. But once you brought that parts information into ePlan Electric P8, ePlan Electric P8, the way it was set up, was so much more that the data that you brought in was really not necessarily usable. So we told all of our customers at the time, it's like, yes, you can import the data, 
you can modify that data, but that's all that we want you to do. If you want to create a new project, don't copy and paste from an old project and try and create it in the new environment. Just create it from scratch, develop a new template because the new templates had so many more op options and, and properties that will allow you to, to generate even more automation in your design process. So for your legacy data, even if it's a CAD environment, you can bring it in the ePlan, you, you can make small modifications, but at the end of the day, you'll still have your graphical environment. And in terms of working with ePlan, start fresh, use the, pro use the templates that we provide, use some data that we provide, use the data portal to start building your projects. And once you build your first project in ePlan, after that, you can from that project easily start building more, start developing your macro library, your template libraries, and then start leveraging the software from there on. Um, we've had many customers which came up to us and said, I've got 5,000 blocks in AutoCAD and I, I need to have them in EPA. And we analyzed those 5,000 blocks and out of the 5,000 blocks, really a lot of them were duplicates. People just copied and pasted the block, made a minor modification, saved it as another block, or it was parts that were already existing in the data portal in ePlan, or it was symbols that we already provided through our symbol library. So the legacy data that they have really isn't, isn't that much when you consider implementing ePlan and creating your projects in ePlan. So it's always a question of looking at what you have, and it gives users also an opportunity to clean up their basement, so to speak, you know, clean up their treasure chest of thousands and thousands of blocks, which then not being used or maybe once in a project five years ago. So um, from that perspective, legacy data, it's always take it with a grain of salt. It's really uh, most of it is unusable and um, start with ePlan data right from the get go and you'll leverage a lot better efficiency in the long run. So it's like buying storage units and you have all your stuff from 20 years ago that you're never going to look at again. And it's just sitting there. And exactly. I mean, you, you pay for the storage, so yep. you might as well use it. We'll keep three or 4,000 of these just sitting there hanging out. And, but you feel like you have a connection to it. So you want to bring it over, and, but it feels like it's a big hill that you have to climb over to get it whenever you don't need it in the first place. That's right. Gotcha. There's a lot of talk about standardizing, and I, I know that it's important, and we'll get to that part of it where it's important to standardize, but, but what does that even mean? Joanna, you want to go? You want to... For sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take a crack at it. And I think from the, the standpoint of your storage units, like you just mentioned, a lot of our customers have uh, the issue where they have a lot of industry experience within their staff, but it's captured in their mind only. And if you have a project within your company, how it's designed, what the enclosure looks like, what the schematics look like are gonna vary dramatically from person to person, even with the same information. And so what ends up happening is one, you don't have a consistent pres presentation to your customer base you don't have the ability to capture that knowledge for those people who have been doing this 20, 30 years that are getting ready to exit the industry. And then you also have a situation where you don't have that buying power with your suppliers because you may have interchangeable parts, but use five different manufacturers and five different suppliers when you really could be using one. So when you start the, the journey of going through all those storage units and kicking out all the things you don't really need, what ends up happening is instead of having, you know, six different lamps for the same room, you find the best one and everybody uses that one lamp, you know, and there's a lot of benefits to that from buying power from, you know, the information and the consistency across your organization. But then also it it's, gives you the opportunity to kind of have the best design for your company instead of everyone else in the company's certain style. And when you take on a journey like ePlan, in addition to going through your parts library and building, hey, what products are we gonna use? There's also a, a motto within ePlan that you do something once and you never do it the same way twice. Because if you're gonna build something, you save it as a macro and everything that you've designed becomes a shortcut to repeat it instantaneously. So when you start looking at different building blocks of a system, 
if you build it as a macro from now on, anybody who builds a system similar to that is going to use all the same parts, all the same design, the same layout, and everything's going to be consistent. So, you know, that it works. And when you need to make a change, you don't make it at a project level where you're copying and pasting over old mistakes. You make it at a macro level to where it's updated across your organization. Okay, what Sean, your turn. What, what, whatever Joanna said. <laughs> whatever Joanna said. I 100% agree. You hit the nail on the head there. Uh, if I if I can just add a couple of comments to that. Uh, one interesting part was when we started with the data portal and we went to Rockwell and we said, okay, let's uh, let's get your parts on the data portal. We did some some workshops in Milwaukee and we sat down with some of the users. And one interesting aspect is there's a card, a PLC card that's used pretty pretty often in the automation world. It's the uh, 1756 IB16. It's a 16 input card and pretty standard, and a lot of people use it. And then the question was, well, how are we going to represent this? What is it going to look like when we put it on the data portal? Well, I went to 50 different customers and each customer showed that card in a different way. I mean, one was on an A4 sheet, one one was a D size sheet, one one was a C size sheet, one was had 16 IOs on one page, the other one had eight on two columns. I mean, it was just all across the board and it's the same card. It's the same card, it has the same amount of connections on every single one of those drawings, but they look drastically different. So when we look at a schematics, a schematics is not supposed to be a, a pretty piece of art. It's not supposed to be the background landscape that I have there. It's supposed to be a functional drawing and you need certain information. You need to know what the part number is. You need to know what the device is. You need to know what the connection is. And once you lay it out once, you just define that as your standard of representation. You put it in a library and then after that, anytime you need to use it, you use the same one over and over again. And if we look at the differences between North American market and the, the European market typically, which is very strong on the IEC, I find that the standardization in Europe is a lot more advanced because they've focused on that IEC layout. They already worked you know, on A3 size sheets that have already confined the environment where they work on. They confine the symbol libraries that they are using. They're starting to confine the naming conventions that they're using and things like that. In North America, we're still far from that. Uh, there are various different standard groups that are there, like the NFPA, the IEEE, ANSI. However, none of them tell you to use a D size sheet, or none of them tell you to use a specific library or symbol in a half an inch grid. So it's really everybody to themselves once they start working at a company. Uh, how did you do those drawings in the past? Well, this is how we're going to continue doing them. And they just keep on doing them with their own little flavor. And I think that's an approach where where a lot of education in the, is needed and the kind of um, idea of standardization is to try and create one look for schematics that everybody can read no matter where you are, no matter what age you're in or what industry you're in. It should all look the same because at the end of the day, it's two electrical components connected by a wire. And, uh, and, and, and we're very strongly pushing that standardization aspect in EPLAN because that standard will give you the efficiency you need in your design. You don't have to think about what that IB16 card is going to look like in your drawings. You just take it and you just place it. There's no interpretation. It's just uh, design. So that, that brings up a couple of questions for me. Number one, when you talk about data portal, for the most part, everybody that's on this call understands what the data portal is. But I think that someone that maybe has never heard of the data portal, that they, they, they're they not completely sure. It, and it's more of a, it's a parts portal. It's a, it's a parts catalog. So yeah. <clears throat> the idea of the data portal is to allow manufacturers to upload their data, which is a contactor from Siemens, a contactor from Allen Bradley, a contactor from Schneider, and put them all in one location so that the users that needs those parts don't have to go to 15 different websites, do a search on the website and try and find the part and then try to convert it and create an ePlan version of that part. So it's manufacturer driven. So the manufacturers create the data and they upload it to the part uh, to the data portal. And then what the users do is they just in the ePlan environment, they just go to the data portal, search for the part number, find it and just click on a button and download it into the design environment. 
Now the data is a lot more uh, detailed than on a regular bill of materials. If you look at bill of materials, typically today, you have the part number, the description, order number, manufacturer, and that's pretty much it, maybe a price. Now in the data portal, that is already there. So you have the part number description to create your bill of materials. However, you have a lot more. You might have the 3D model. You might have the uh, wiring information. So how many connections do you have to wire? How many holes do you have to drill? What are the electrical characteristics of that particular part? And then many more. So it's really an, a, a rich environment of data for each part that the user doesn't have to figure out by looking at a PDF. He can just use it and take advantage of it in his design environment. And Joanna, that has to be a good selling proposition whenever you're meeting with someone for the first time saying, look, we, we have this tool available to you. We're gonna make your life a lot easier. Yeah, I mean, yes and no. One of the things that makes it hard from a sales perspective is we give that information away for free. So, you know, one of the things that a lot of the customers don't know is you can actually register for our free account through our ePulse website. And all of that information supplied by the manufacturers, you can access and view. So, you know, from a sales standpoint, that's really good for your field technicians because if they're out in the field and they need information on a part, they don't have to have ePlan, they don't have to be connected to a VPN, they don't have to have access to a project file. They can just go into the data portal and we have also the ability for them to access projects through our cloud hosted services. And then they can look at part information, manufacturing information, manuals, all that good stuff in the data portal right from you know, their tablet. Do you feel like standardization, Joanna, helps these clients or, or new customers that you have that helps them in this time whenever we have a little bit more it's a little bit more difficult for these customers to have uh, as big of a, a skilled labor force as they've had in the past i one of the things that i struggled with early on in, in my career when i worked for you know the bulk material handling industry is that we had a few gentlemen that would wire panels and only certain kind of panels. And so whenever something would happen and one of our staff members would be out for illness or on a job site, everything would stop. So they would be 50% done with wiring an enclosure, they'd leave for two weeks, and then they'd come back and start again. There was no way for that to be carried on by somebody else. Likewise, on the design phase, you couldn't have multiple people working on the same project. If it was one person's design, they had to be the one to finish it. So when you start talking about standardization, you can have multiple people within your organization working on the same project, and it's gonna be a consistent use of products, a consistent look, a consistent design across the entire project, even with several different people working on it. And then, you know, should the changes in the market happen where you lose staff members, what they know and how they did things is captured and usable for future projects. It's not lost when they leave. And it, it also helps to like for summer right now, whenever people are going on vacation and, and you have a very happy workplace and, and any, anybody that's working anywhere wants a little vacation time, but from an employer standpoint, it, it's tough because you have to have somebody to fill in and know exactly what's going on, but that information is already there. Absolutely. Yeah. Sean, what do you think? What, what, what's your take on, on the the labor uh, the the shortage of of labor that we have right now and and this topic of standardization. Well, the the shortage of labor means that people have to do more with less. So now they they piling on the projects. So now you instead of having three people working on on five projects, you've got one person working on those five projects. So the topic of automation, the topic of efficiency in your engineering process is huge. And, and people need the tools to be able to perform the same work or actually more work now that they used to perform before, still at the same quality at the same rate. And, and this is exactly where ePlan kind of fits in. You don't necessarily need the five people anymore. You can do the work with one, but you need to standardize for that because if you try to recreate five different projects in five different layouts and five different looks, uh, you're just going to go crazy as a, as a as a user. So you want to be able to be efficient in your design process, and the the tools standardizing in in the software plus the tools will really help you to achieve that efficiency. So suddenly now you just 
creating five projects in no time where before it was a struggle just to create one. And it's, uh, it's really due to standardization at the end of the day. So streamlining those processes. I want to find out a little bit more about both you and Joanna, because I asked these questions, so we got to go over them. Um, we know that your first ever job was ePlan because pretty much on, on your headstone, it's going to be ePlan lifer. <laughs> um, but your favorite sports team, Sean, uh, Liverpool FC. So yeah. does that mean you like football better than football? I like uh, the real football, yeah, not the American football. <laughs> So uh, why do you... it's, it's kind of weird because my, my family, I've got an aunt that's a Manchester United fan and cousins that are Tottenham Hotspur fans. And I'm looking through the entire family tree and I can't see a Liverpool fan. But if I look at pictures of me at four or five years old, I'm running around in a Liverpool jersey. So I don't know who slipped that in there, but he did a good job. I've been a Liverpool fan ever since. Why, why do you want to meet Keanu Reeves? I don't know. He just seems, uh, from everything I read about him, the guy's just a down-to-earth guy. He's just, uh, he's just a, you know, just a normal guy that you just want to hang out with and just have a, have a fun time, just talk about everything and nothing at the same time. It's kind of, I don't know. He's, uh, he's got that, that personality. He's just down-to-earth. He's just uh, very, uh, very polite, very friendly, very helpful, and uh, it's, uh, it's very, uh, very attractive. Not in an emotional sense, but in a <laughs> friendly sense so what a favorite movie with keanu reeves in it oh um yeah the last one that he did what is it john wick i i like okay. the john wick series that's pretty cool brutal Joanna, do you do you have a favorite keanu reeves movie you know i can't even think of a keanu reeves movie so i, I can't say i'm a big buff uh, i think speed is maybe a movie i saw but no i'm not really i i haven't even seen john wick my my movie watching is certainly lacking okay so uh i would say both of those are wrong point break is definitely the best movie keanu reeves was ever in um <laughs> I, will, so. I, will, I will i will concede yeah i mean patrick swayze keanu reeves I, you know johnny just mentioned the matrix and as usual johnny's right that's got to be the best keanu no reeves no no movie ever no i see i, I don't agree it's point break it has to be point break johnny <laughs> think about it point break well, they were they they you know they're robbers and there's i mean there's everything in that movie it's awesome there, there's uh 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 anthony kiedis from the red hot chili peppers is in that movie i don't know if y'all remember that or not but that's that's going back old school i love point break i think it's one of my favorite movies so uh in canada he does seem like a a, a pretty cool guy i have to say uh something we don't know about you is that you grew up on a farm yes okay so th that's probably where you learned a lot about electrical engineering right there well no unfortunately the farm was not really automated it was more manual <laughs> than anything else so i was probably carrying the wires but not connecting them um no I, it's 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 a tremendous experience and uh when you talk about you know becoming a little more humble about the environment it's, uh, it's working on a farm i mean the, the the cows and the animals really don't have any vacation so you just work day in and day out taking care of them feeding them in the morning cleaning up the stalls and it really is hard intensive labor but it's very satisfying too when you spend your whole day on a field you know just uh, just just plowing the field and at the end of the day you look down and you look at the field and it's just all completed it's quite quite satisfying too so it's uh it's a very humbling experience, but extremely, uh, extremely valuable. Talk about no days off, zero That's days true. off. Mm -hmm. And I would, I wish, I, I have a friend that his family has a farm here or around Houston. And I said, will you take my, both of my kids who are 15 and 11, just take them for one week, please take them for two days. I don't care what it is. I want them to see what it's like to not have YouTube and video games for a whole day. And them to complain and say that I'm bored, they would love to be bored if they were lived on a farm because it's Absolutely. a lot of work. Absolutely. Joanna, and it's, nothing, it's nothing like the Paris Hilton uh, reality TV show. <laughs> <laughs> that, was that was a good show, though. I have to say, I like that. I thought that was a good one. Uh, Joanna, your first job was wa waitressing at an ice cream parlor. Was that on in Washington as well? No, I actually um, was born and raised in the Kansas Kansas City area, a small town suburb, and it was very much like, you know, the Andy Griffith show, uh, you know, brick streets. I, I also grew up on some land with, you know, farm animals and um, 
you know, is the kind of place where, you know, the same people who came into your restaurant, you know, were like the 12th people in town. So, you know, I, everyone knew you, I knew everyone, and it, it was actually a lot of fun. Um, I uh, wouldn't ever go back and do it again because it was certainly backbreaking labor, much like farming. But, you know, it's one of those things I, I can relate with Sean, you know, something as simple as plowing a field at the end of the day, there's just such a sense of accomplishment to tangibly see the the output of your labor. And that would explain why you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Yes, you know, I, I, I'm i pretty much an all things Kansas City fan. So, you know, even with the, the huge Seahawks influence here in Seattle, I've managed to stay loyal to the home team. I actually moved away from Kansas City right before both the Royals and the Chiefs became all of a sudden really good and relevant. So, you know, I, I didn't get to be a part of the parade, but uh, it's still been fun to watch. Now, I feel like a bandwagoner because everybody loves the Chiefs, but I like them when they were terrible. So I feel like I've got some street cred there. Well, I, you know, I completely understand that. I'm a Saints fan. So, and I also okay, appreciate yeah. you staying a Kansas City fan and not being a Seattle fan, being that I'm a Saints fan. Yes. That, I don't know no. if you and I could get along very well. And the person that you would like to meet, and we talked about maybe not talking about this, but I feel like this <laughs> is a guy that everybody wants to meet, especially if you've seen that his latest Netflix show uh, about um, space, and that's Elon Musk. Did you watch that show on Netflix? I've seen the previews, but I haven't watched it yet. Um, but, you know, he's just a crazy person who has a fearlessness about him that's propelled him to great success. And, you know, his educational background, it's just not that spectacular. It's its just more the, the vision and the bravery to go after it, I, I think is admirable. Definitely a, a strange, unique individual, I guess you'd say. Yeah, I agree. I think he's fascinating. And I think yeah. that that looking at the watching the show on Netflix is great because he's at the point where he said, I don't have any money. I I don't I, I, we we don't have a chance to go up into space again. And then he made it happen. And then after that, the rest is history, really. Right. So I, I think that a lot of us are I, Canu and and Elon. How about hanging out with both of them? That would be kind of cool. Good choice, Joanna. <laughs> I, like the, I like the Elon Musk <laughs> Something that Sean sent me just a couple of days ago is a question that I think is would have I, I want to I want to hear your answers, but I think it's a great question. How do you explain e plan to a six year old? Yeah. Um, I I think maybe using a building blocks example, you know. If AutoCAD is Legos, then ePlan would be Minecraft. You know, you don't, it may be a block, but that block has texture and it's maybe moving water or it's fire. It's not just a block. That's really Top good. Batch, yeah, that's really <laughs> good. Okay, we're done. Thanks everybody for joining yes. us. <laughs> that is pretty good. Yeah, <laughs> like it. And now in Minecraft, you can do a whole bunch of automation too. It's uh, it's quite quite impressive what they've done with Minecraft. So, Sean, do you have you have anything that you want to add to that? Or are you good with that answer? Well, I my my approach is uh, is, is pretty simple, and I keep it in the house. Everybody flicks a light switch. So when you click flick the switch, the light goes on. Well, how does that happen? It's not magic, you know. You've got wires behind the wall that connect the switch to the lamp, and then it goes to the power supply your switch box at the bottom of, a, of the stairs. And then, uh, and basically ePlan just helps you to put everything together to design all of that system. But we don't do it for houses necessarily, we do it for any type of machinery and big equipment. You just lost a six-year-old. Yeah. No, they, you lost them in the second you sentence. Click the switch all the time. Should have stuck with Minecraft. Yeah, if you stick with Minecraft, you would have had them the whole way, but no. <laughs> No, you, you, you win, Joanna. You win. Yes, yes. I, I, I'm going to say that one tally mark right there. I think um, that's going to be like what Sean ate, Joanna won in terms of greatest contributions to technical discussions. I'll keep uh, that. I feel like I need a ribbon. There you go. I don't know. If, I don't know if we touched on this earlier or not, but Sean, this is something that that you mentioned in a schematic earlier. What's the purpose of a schematic? So the purpose of a schematic is twofold. 
Well, the first is to be able to build the control system. So you need to put that control system together. You need to connect the motor to a cable. You need to connect that cable to a junction box, that junction box to a control panel. Inside there, you need to put the control devices and all that. So it basically, it's, a, it's an instruction manual on how to wire a machine and a system so that it works the way that you want it to work. So that's the first goal. And the second goal is once that machine is running, when the machine is producing, is doing its job, if anything goes wrong, you need to troubleshoot it. And to troubleshoot that machine, you always go back to your schematics and you identify, okay, this motor went wrong. What is it connected with? Or where does it get its power from? Or what are the other devices that, that control that device? So if we look at the schematic following those two purposes, it's always challenging to create the schematic in a way that it can support both. And you always have to take the short end on one or the other. And most of the drawings today, if you look at the schematics, they're geared towards building the machine. So you design the system to be able to build it. But afterwards, when you look at a schematic to try and troubleshoot it, it's always a big challenge to try and figure out where are the components on the pages and navigate the whole environment. So it's a, so the, the, to answer your question, it's really those two particular purposes. It's really functional and for built and for troubleshooting. Joanna, this is your chance to get number two. So. Uh, I mean, in the simplest of terms, a schematic is just a graphical representation of what's going on with your system. And it, it's the the industry has always been geared towards creating a schematic and creating a drawing and that was your output um that was the the deliverable that was the end result whereas with the knee plan that's something we can produce but the data is what's driven behind it and what we're trying to create a schematic a bomb you know a panel layout that's just a report so i think that's the big difference between you know as, as sean was talking about earlier between what's been done with CAD in the past is, you know, we're not operating on the basis of how do I create a schematic? We're operating on the basis of how do I design a system and then print a schematic. By the way, don't mention bomb on an airplane, right? <laughs> <laughs> Have you done this yeah. before, Sean? There's, there's gotta be a story here for this warning. No, yeah, no. are you on the phone and saying, know. yeah, yeah, if you could, if you could, um, I'm about to get on this plane. If you could just send me uh, that bomb, then right. I'll look at it before we start. And then right. people freak out, and it's not a good thing. I, I, no. It's not a good look at all. No. Not a good look. Probably not. Is it possible to automate design whenever you have uh, different machines? Is that something that that you can do successfully, Sean? Yes, um, <clears throat> a big misconception, I think, in the in the design world is that people always think, oh, to be able to automate, you have to have high volume and high quantity and everything has to be very similar with kind of uh, subsets and different variations. And in the electrical world, there's a lot of repetition. If you look at, at machines from a mechanical perspective, the machines are completely different, different sizes, different colors, different purposes, different functions. But if you break down those machines to the electrical components, they'll typically always have motors, they'll always have cables, they'll always have control cabinets, they'll always have the same equipment, maybe different manufacturers. One is from Siemens, the other one is from Allen Bradley, from Schneider. However, from a wiring perspective, even though the machines are physically and mechanically different, electrically, they're pretty much the same. You have a power supply, you have a power distribution, you have to protect your devices and you have to control them. And it's just plus or minus 10 of each depending on the machine. So why not create your standardized circuits and then plug them into a configurator where you just say, I need five of this, boom, generates five of them. You need 20 of this, it generates 20 of them. The machines could be completely different. They don't even have to be the same, don't have the same purpose. You can still automate. And that's the beauty of being in the schematics world in the control world, there's really a lot of efficiencies you can gain by automating that aspect of it. Well done. Joanna. Getting back to working like we did just a few years ago, uh, and, and there was a reference we made to this earlier. Do you see that it's opening up a lot more and that you're going to be out um, doing a lot more travel in, in the coming months? I know with that, it's kind of like we don't know. The, things are getting to where they were back a year and a half ago, and then they're not, and back and forth. But 
how do you see things progressing uh, the way that we're working in uh, less of a virtual environment? You know, I, I think we've all learned how to adapt to being remote located and tools like Zoom where we can still get together while being remote have been really beneficial. And I, I think there's enhanced usage of those tools, but nothing beats being in the same room and, you know, putting your hands on the, the system, walking through, you know, manufacturing shops. There's just no amount of virtual tours are going to get you that same experience. So, uh, you know, from my standpoint, and I think Sean can say the same thing, you know, when I walk through uh, a panel shop, for instance, you know, I'm not just looking at what manufacturing equipment they have. I'm, I'm looking at drawings. I'm checking to see who's flipping through what pages. Are there yellow highlighters on the floor? You know, that's the kind of stuff that clues me into where there are some efficiencies to be gained. And you just can't get that over the phone. And, you know, I, I think more people are starting to realize that getting minds together in the same room just exponentially speeds up the development process compared to being on a WebEx. So, so for sure, I got my bag packed. Mm -hmm. It's the reading the room. You can't read the room if you're yeah. not in the room. Right. And that makes it, it makes it difficult too from a communication standpoint, because whenever there's something going on with, with whoever you're talking to, that is your point of contact and, and you're in the same room, then, you know, if somebody's coming in and say, ask a, a question about this or something you can help with or whatever it might be that you're right there and you're involved and maybe you're not as involved. And so I think that what you're saying is that it'll get better because you you will be visiting more people. That bag is packed, and so we expect you to be up and down the the, the coast in the next few months, and and even to some Absolutely. of the shows, right? Yeah, you know I haven't um, done too many shows here. A lot of them have been really scaled back, but uh, you know I I'm a creature of habit, so I normally have a suitcase that's just packed and that's just my travel bag that's got everything. I, you know, when I get home, I clean it and repack it and it's just ready to go. And for the last two years, I've had empty suitcases in my closet. So it, it's nice to have that bag preloaded and ready to go again and have a reason to. Um, but, you know, it was also going to touch on how many times I've traveled with the, our consultants like Sean and they'll get in front of a customer who loves ePlan and is very happy with, you know, what they're doing and how they're growing. And the customer will be walking through a process they do and they'll go, look, I can do this great report that gives me all this data and eight steps. And someone like Sean will go, great, but if you click this button, you can do it in one, you know? And so that's the benefit of being in front of a customer. So often we don't know what we don't know. So we, we only get the information that someone chooses to give us when we're virtual. Whereas when we're face-to-face, -face, we can, you know, pick up on those other clues and see other, you know, atmospheric information that contributes to finding better ways to do things. So I'm excited to be back out there. The other fun part of that too, is every time you go visit a customer, they're very proud of what they do. So they really want to show you. So they'll take you in the back and show you things. And, and it's fascinating the different kinds of machines and the ideas that these people come up with. It's just really, really cool. Absolutely. It's, it's engineering, so it's skilled, but it, it, there's also a bit of artistry that that Absolutely. goes along with that. And so you do want to show off what you create. So I think that that's that's probably an important thing that that a lot of people don't pick up on. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. You know, next week we so we're taking off next week with Open Line Friday and the following week cuz we're going to start doing this every other week. The following week we're going to have Jeff Kilburn on and we're going to find out a lot about what we've been through so far this year and really where we're going. So I think that that's an important thing that we talked about, uh, getting out and seeing more people and and just being um, being back on the shop floor in a lot of places. And that's something that Jeff's going to touch on. So thanks to both of you so much Josh, for- Josh, for... I think we got uh, still one question in the chat. That's okay. Okay. Like, uh, Sean, as a product architect, can you talk about your favorite product in the ePlan platform? And oh, of course he would. Of course he would. Utilize it to become even more efficient yeah he would go after your ego right here yeah absolutely so <laughs> are, i mean without without i'm going to skip over p8 and pro panel because for me those are the two most used products in the platform but i think my favorite one is e-plan pre-planning and e-plan pre-planning is a, is a, is is a diamond in the rough so to speak because it has so many capabilities but 
it, it is a little bit of challenging to get started with it because it gives you a complete new environment where you can structure your machine, you can structure your system, and then you can already plug in a lot of data and then very quickly you can leverage that data to start driving your pH, to start driving your pro panel a lot quicker and a lot faster. So I think it's a, it's a really underutilized tool that everybody should have in their, in their back pocket and should be using on a daily basis. Yeah, I, I agree. That, that that would be my favorite too, Sean. And just the way that it touches all aspects of the business from the, the design side, the sales side, all the way through. It's a fully integrated product. So, you know, by the time you put a, together a quote, you're halfway done with your schematics. It's it's beautiful. I guess we can expect that both of you were gonna do a uh, a pre planning video coming up, right? Absolutely. I'm up for it. <laughs> yeah. From Sean's background. Yeah, or John, even the shipping industry up in Seattle, right? Yeah, absolutely. Johnny had another question too, Sean, if you want to look over that one. Yes, um, so I think it was the IEC 81346, 6182, and 61355. So they all uh, all crazy numbers, but each number is a very important aspect in the design process of electrical controls. So the IEC 81346 really helps you to structure your system. So when you look at a motor, what are the most important questions that you ask? What is it? Where is it? And what does it do? And the IEC 81346 through a structuring principle allows you to answer those three questions. So it helps you to tag the motor as what does it do? It helps you to tag that motor as where is it located? And it helps you to tag that motor as what is it actually as a, as a device? And if you apply that to all of the components in your electrical system, it really brings clarity into the whole control aspect. And it really segregates functions, identifies locations, identifies products, and helps the user not only build the machine faster, but also in troubleshooting since scenarios uh, leverage that a lot better. In term of the 61082, that's pretty much a standard defining the design environment. So. Instead of figuring out, am I going to design on an A size sheet? Is it going to be landscape, portrait? Is it going to be D size? How many ladders? It really tells you what is the size of the page? What is the title block going to look like? And that's the amount of space you have to create your schematics. This is how the cross references are going to look like and things like that. So it really helps you to get your template up and running. And finally, the 61355, that's a standard that helps you identify or organize your design into documents. Say these documents are my schematic documents. These are my block diagrams. These are my control panel layouts. These are my process documents. So it really helps you to organize your documentation in a structure that is easy to find and navigate. So um, those are. It's a good thing we didn't get too technical here. So, <laughs> I said in the beginning of this that we weren't going to be getting too technical. So it's a good thing we didn't that we didn't cross that line. That's right. Getting too technical on this. So. That's right. All right, our time our time is done. But uh, again, thank both of, thanks to both of you for for giving up. Uh, well, Sean, it was past your lunch, and Joanna, you have another hour until your lunch, I think. So uh, I appreciate it. Have yourself a fantastic weekend, and uh, hopefully you'll join me again in a few months to come back on Open Line Friday. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Josh. And uh, looking forward thanks, to guys. another one. Yeah. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs>